Question, what does the Bible say about the three wise men, or magi? In this video, I'll answer that question from a biblical perspective, and afterwards, I'll share some helpful resources, so stick around to the end. We assume that there were three wise men because of the three gifts that were given, gold, incense, and myrrh. However, the Bible does not say that there were only three wise men. There could have been many more. Tradition says that there were three and that their names were Gaspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. But since the Bible does not say, we have no way of knowing whether the tradition is accurate. It is a common misconception that the wise men visited Jesus at the stable on the night of his birth. In fact, the wise men came days, months, or possibly even years later. That is why Matthew chapter 2 verse 11 says the wise men visited and worshipped Jesus in a house, not at a stable. We know that the Magi were wise men from the east, most likely Persia or modern-day Iran. This means that the wise men traveled 800 to 900 miles to see the Christ child. Most likely, the Magi knew of the writings of the prophet Daniel, who in times past had been the chief of the court seers in Persia. Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 27 include a prophecy which gives a timeline for the birth of the Messiah. Also, the Magi may have been aware of the prophecy of Balaam, who was from the town of Pethor on the Euphrates River near Persia. In Numbers chapter 24 verse 17, Balaam's prophecy specifically mentions a star coming out of Jacob. The wise men were guided to look for the king of the Jews by miraculous stellar event, the star of Bethlehem, which they called his star in Matthew 2 verse 2. They came to Jerusalem and asked concerning the birth of Christ, and they were directed to Bethlehem. They followed God's guidance joyfully. When they arrived in Bethlehem, they gave costly gifts to Jesus and worshipped him. God warned them in a dream against returning to Herod, so in defiance of the king, they left Judah by another route. So, the Magi were men who, one, read and believed God's word, two, sought Jesus, three, recognized the worth of Christ, four, humbled themselves to worship Jesus, and five, obeyed God rather than men. They were truly wise men. Well, good morning. I thought I would begin this morning with a a little bit of clarification for the wise men. And if you weren't uh, here last Sunday night, you didn't get to hear my clarification, my correction about the distance. Um, not 9,200 miles, but 920 miles. So I uh, want to make sure we're all clear about that. Um, but this series that we are, have embarked on in this Christmas season, um, Christmas Uncluttered, was based on the idea that so many people have this time of year. It can be anything but um, the most joyous time. It can be a time of such busyness that we lose focus of what it's all supposed to be about. And it's all, this whole series, this four-part series, all has to do with what comes from a prophecy given about 600 years before Christ was born. And that is by the prophet Isaiah in chapter 9, verse 6. And so I'm going to read that uh, once again to you. We're going to look at the third part, the third title that's associated with Jesus. And again, it says this, Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And so we've covered so far, we talked about how um, God is our wonderful counselor. He guides us. He shows us the way to go. The fact that um, he also is the mighty God, the one that is to be obeyed and sought after. Today we look at the fourth title, and that is that Jesus actually is the everlasting Father. I really want you to think about that as we go through today's message about how Jesus is the everlasting Father. You may have had someone knock on your door before and, and tell you certain things. One of the things they tell you is that Jesus is mighty God, but he's not the almighty God, as if the, he's some lower created God. And uh, a lot of people who canvass neighborhoods and knock on doors say things like that. But let's deal with the fact that he's also called the everlasting Father. How do you get around that Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are but one God? Yes, I know it's hard for some of the pea, little pea brain like myself to wrap, wrap it around this idea that there is one God yet manifests himself in three persons, but he is God. God can do things and he is things that we are not. 
He can do things we cannot do. He thinks things that we don't think. And so when it comes to Jesus and appreciating truly who He is and put the, the proper perspective in Christmas, let's talk about the fact that Jesus is our everlasting Father. So many songs we sing at Christmas time have to do with the idea that Christmas time is supposed to be a joyful time. I mean, uh, I think I referenced this one uh, recently. The song is the most wonderful time of the year. Maybe songs like, uh, Have a Holly Jolly Christmas. Or even ones like uh, chestnuts roasting on an open fire or, or jingle bells. They all kind of communicate the idea of this kind of Norman Rockwell picture perfect idea that I think so many people, certainly Americans, have in their mind that they're trying to live up to. They're trying to make their Christmas like that storybook way. And they, they seek their joy in the celebration of Christmas. And often Christmas is anything for them but the most wonderful time of the year. But what Christmas has come for many people, for many people in the world, and uh, really not just Christmas, but really even the whole struggles of life in general make it anything but that joyous time. It's a busy time. It's one that is financially taxing for some people who extend themselves that way. There are those who have end of year pressures at work trying to wrap up things for the end of the year. There's just gen good old general winter depression that can happen. And then certainly there's the thing of missing loved ones when you look at your own Norman Rockwell type picture and people are missing from that picture, it can become anything but joyous, sometimes almost depressing. And that's what Christmas Uncluttered is all about. If you're going to celebrate Christmas, there's only one way for your Christmas to be joyful, but that the joy is not linked to Christmas, but to Christ. This illusion at Christmas really is not an unusual thing. Maybe you, you, you experience this let down yourself or you know people, people in your family, and people you work with that, that really, really get depressed during this time. Because the truth is we get so hyped up about the expectations of Christmas that what it's supposed to be that often the real thing just doesn't measure up and because of that we become let down and disappointed. What can you do this Christmas to avoid all of those pitfalls and traps? How can you improve your true joy this Christmas? Well, the truth is the answers for that are going to be found this morning. We're going to look into the lives of the wise men. Now, so far in this series, we contrasted life in the world and life in the spiritual kingdom of God. We contrasted last week the, the, uh, the shepherds and what they were doing to prepare themselves. And, and we looked at, at the uh, wise men and their seeking of the Lord and compared it to King Herod and why King Herod missed out on everything that happened on that first Christmas morning. Today we're going to delve in a little bit further. I find the wise men very fascinating, mysterious characters. Because there are things said about them, but there's not a lot of things said about them. A lot of times the legend of the wise men is greater or certainly different than what we know for sure uh, about these wise men, uh, as, as the video was trying to help explain. But the truth is what I find so fascinating about the wise men is they come from an ungodly nation. They come from a nation where Yahweh is not worshipped as God. Yet they have come a long distance, 920 miles or so, <laughs> to worship this king of the Jews that was born. They found that star in the east. So here is what we're going to be talking about today. Here's my proposition to you. From the wise men of the Christmas story, we learn how to have the joy of Christ in our lives every single day. That's what it's really about not just joy of Christmas, it is joy every single day in Christ. We're going to look at three lessons from the wise men that help us understand how to have joy every single day. Let's begin with a word of prayer. God, I, I thank you for bringing us together in this place on the Lord's day, around the Lord's table. We count it, God, as a great privilege to be here and assemble in your name. Father, I pray you open our hearts and minds, and God, that we there may be some here this morning that are struggling this time of year that we're, we even talked about how many people we know, brothers and sisters in Christ, have gone on to the reward and even that loss we mourn. God, I pray today that we realize that there is joy to be had. Even in the midst of our mourning, there's joy to be had in Christ. Teach us and open our hearts today in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So three lessons from the, fri the wise man. Here's the first one. Here's the, they're all questions. And the first question is, uh, what do you seek? Because we can understand clearly what the wise man sought. See, the truth is, the level of your joy at Christmas and every other day of the year will be directly related to what you are seeking. Now, the truth is, the reason why uh, Christmas is not joyful for people or other times of the year are not joyful is because they're seeking the wrong things. What is it? Ask yourself this morning, what is it that would make your Christmas wonderful and satisfying in your own mind? Uh, how do you think about that? Uh, for some people, it's just, uh, well, we have snow on a Christmas day. I know how many people, every time they look at the weather forecast, they get they're disappointed because it's not going to be a white Christmas this year. And so that's part of their joy. Maybe it's just because um, they get all their family together. Uh, we're certainly excited. We're going to have a house full plus uh, overrunning the hotels and everything else this uh, Christmas. We're excited to have a lot of people here from our family. Um, and it's okay to be happy about those things and look forward to that. But a lot of people put all their joy in their family. And that's why it's really interesting that sometimes when family gets together, it can be a difficult time. And so, you know, you, you set boundaries of what you can talk about, what you can't talk about it. Everything that happens when a large family gets together. Maybe it's just a feeling, you think, or something you might define as holiday or Christmas spirit. You're looking for that, and that's what you anticipate will be the key to your joy. Maybe it's just finding the right gift to give to someone you care about, or maybe it's, for some people, receiving <laughs> that particular gift that you're really looking forward to that you think will be the joy to your Christmas. The problem is, with all of these things, no doubt will lead to some disappointment and disillusionment about Christmas. Have you ever had that kind of experience? Have you ever, ever had a Christmas where you really felt, it doesn't even, I hear people say this all the time, you know, it just doesn't feel like Christmas. And that's because there's something missing they expected to have. The problem is not Christmas, my dear friends. The problem is expectations. The truth is, sometimes we seek the wrong things. And here's a lesson I really want to drive home this morning. And that is this. If your joy is set in the celebration itself, rather than what we are celebrating, you will always be disappointed. In other words, if joy is linked to Christmas, rather than to Christ, it will most certainly, in some level, be disappointing. Many people are seeking Christmas in their heart when what they really need is Christ. Christmas is to a wounded heart. This is going to sound like a strange illustration to you, but uh, you know I'm strange already, so it's not, nothing new for you. <laughs> Christmas to a wounded heart is like morphine to terminal cancer. When the morphine wears off, the pain returns. Isn't that true? And for a lot of people, that's what happens. Even if we have a temporary distraction in Christmas, because we do have a good experience and things feel right, when the season passes, then the, it's even worse because the pain returns because we have set our joy in the wrong thing. So let's look at the wise men and see what they did. Because they teach us that seeking, what's important to seek is to worship the Lord. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. We pick up the story of the wise men. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. Now, uh, a lot of times you hear, for the wise men, you hear them sometimes called the magi. The reason why they're called the magi, because that's the actual the original word. Uh, in the Greek, the word is magi. It basically means this kind of priestly cast of people from Persia, uh, who are known as the wise men. Now, they're, they're referenced also in the Old Testament, as the video discussed in the book of Daniel and other places, um, where these ungodly nations had their own wise men. Uh, interesting in, in those story, uh, that the wise men of the ungodly nations were compared and confounded to the wisdom, the divine wisdom given to Daniel. But it's interesting, as he was appointed head of the wise men, how things perhaps changed and how this group that was no, no, known for searching the stars, almost like modern uh, ancient uh, astrology. Yeah, astronomy, science, astrology, not. Okay, there we go. <laughs> astrology, searching for answers in the stars. But God used the very thing they were seeking to help them seek the Lord. So it says there, the wise man, it says, for we saw his star. Obviously, in this timeline that Daniel was given, 
was passed along. They were searching for this star. Uh, as, as it was pointed out, there was even a prophecy about the star that was going to uh, be coming. And notice it says here, we have come to worship him. That was, to me, that, that's mind-blowing and astounding that these people from an ungodly uh, uh, nation had made this long distance to travel to come and worship the Almighty God. Christmas for them was an opportunity to worship Jesus. That's really what Christmas should be about. That is why we need to be looking for and expecting for at Christmas time an opportunity to worship, a fresh glimpse to perhaps see He who was born King of the Jews. In Psalm chapter 105, verse 3 and 4, it says, Glory is His name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Let those who seek the Lord rejoice. This Christmas, if you will truly not just be caught up in the joy of Christmas, but the joy of Christ and seek your joy and turn into worship of the Lord, let me tell you, you will not be disappointed. It goes on there in verse 4 and says, Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His presence continually. Jeremiah has a very familiar passage. In Jeremiah 29, 12, and 13, uh, he said this, Then you will call upon me, this is the Lord speaking here, you will call upon me and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart and I will be found by you, declares the Lord. What a great encouragement. I will be found by you. You know, Jesus said, Matthew 7, 7, seek and you will find. Ask, seek, knock. That's what God is trying to call us to. Um, of course, one of the famous lines Jesus is known for, Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. So our goal this Christmas is to worship Jesus. Then, if it is, I doubt very seriously you'll be dissatisfied. You've heard it said before, you know, uh, wise men were seeking him, wise men still seek him. But let me add to that. Yes, wise men seek him, wiser men find him, and the wisest men follow him. That's truly what it means to seek the Lord. And so I ask you, what are you seeking this morning? Let's move on to the second lesson. Where do you look? Where do you look? Your level of joy at Christmas will also be related to where you are looking. Reminds me of a story I read about a man down in Florida named Preacher Mike. And Preacher Mike uh, was uh, walking in the church grounds the day after Christmas. When he walked by the church's nativity scene that was on the lawn, as he passed by, he noticed that there was no baby Jesus in the cradle. He turned toward the church and he, began, he pulled out his cell phone and he was getting ready to call the police. But as he was about to, to, he saw a little boy from church named Jimmy with a little red wagon. And in the little red wagon was this figure of the Christ child. So preacher Mike, Mike walks up to Jimmy and says, well, Jimmy, uh, where did you get that little infant? Well, Jimmy said, well, I got him from the church. Mike said, well, why did you take him? Well, with a little smile, Jimmy said, well, about a week before Christmas, I prayed to the little Lord Jesus. I told him if he would bring me a little red wagon for Christmas, I would give him a ride around the block. <laughs> now, that's, a, that's kind of a silly story, but you know something? You know what I liked about that story? I noticed, well, here's a little boy who knows who to talk to. Here's a little boy who knows where to look. He knew where good, the, every good and perfect gift comes from, and that's the Lord himself, and no, really, no one else. I saw a t-shirt this week I thought was interesting. <laughs> it said, uh, I'm not being good for Santa, I'm being good for Jesus. I thought, isn't that true? Ultimately, that's what we're looking at. That's what we're trying to turn our hearts toward. That's what we're, we're trying to see. And so many people, unfortunately, though, are looking in the wrong place. I, I think it's interesting when you look at the story of the wise men, we even learned that at first they were looking, uh, ultimately they were looking in the right place, but they, they, looked at, they got distracted in a few places because verse uh, 1, again, I'll read it to you, says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Now remember, the king of the Jews... Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But here they are, these priestly 
rich kings, whatever they are, seeking the Lord. They think, ah, the king of the Jews is going to be born. Let's go to the capital city. And let's go to the capital house, go to the palace, and let's go see the king. That would be normal, right? You would think that's pretty reasonable. But they go there. That's not where Jesus is born. He's not born in, in Jerusalem. He's not born in a palace. He's born in a, in, a, in a feed trough, essentially. He's placed there. So wise men look at the palace of the capital city. And, and also, we too sometimes look in the wrong places. We look for joy in this world. We look at it for, we look for things to find joy. We look to our job to find joy. We look uh, at money to give us joy, or maybe even our family to give us joy. And let me tell you something, because uh, I told somebody recently, the only thing I love more than my family on earth is the kingdom of God. Now, God's not a, I, I, I said on earth, right? The only thing I love more than my family, I love my family a lot. I, I, I'm richly blessed by my family. But let me tell you something. Don't use your family relationships to fuel your joy. Hear me on this. Don't use your family relationships to fuel your joy. Use your joy to fuel your family relationships. That's a difference, isn't it? In other words, if I put all of my source of joy in my family, it's going to ultimately fall apart. Families fall apart. Families disappoint. Eventually, families die. <laughs> but if your joy is in the Lord, you use that joy that comes from the Lord to fuel your family, your healthy family relationships. It's the way we think about it. Instead of receiving only... Now, I get a lot of, of, of joy and happiness from my family, but ultimately my joy comes from Christ, and I use that joy to help fuel relationships in my family. And that's what we got to be careful. Some people look for joy in a bottle. They look for joy in a needle. They look for joy in promiscuity. But there is no joy there. There's only a hollow promise at very best. We're told to look at Jesus, aren't we? I think it's interesting when John the Baptizer... Jesus' cousin, who was his forerunner, he started his ministry six months before Jesus did, beginning to tell people and prepare them to receive the Messiah, who is the kingdom of God was at hand, right? It says one day when he was looking, he saw Jesus. He looked at Jesus. And apparently, even though he was related to Jesus, and he had grown up with Jesus, and he knew things about Jesus, something happened on that particular day, because John was with two of his followers, and he looked at Jesus and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He looked to Jesus. And it's also interesting, then his followers began to look at Jesus. That's who we're commanded to look at. A couple of other verses Paul says, Colossians 3, 2, Set your mind on the things above and not on earthly things. Where you look is extremely important, and where you look will affect your joy all year long. Uh, another verse, I could go on and on with these verses, but one more. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the beginner and the ender of our faith. He initiated it, and he will finish it. That's who Jesus is, so fix your eyes on him. Ultimately, even though we see that maybe the expectations were not 100% correct, this is what I love about the story of the wise men. Even though they got diverted to Jerusalem, even though they went to the wrong king, to the wrong place looking for the, the, the right king, ultimately because they were seeking and looking to God, they found the place, didn't they? And that's the way it is. We're not always going to be 100% perfect in where we look and where we seek. But if we continue to seek and we continue to set our, our mind on things above, God will lead us to the place we need to be. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, they looked up and they found that star. It says, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose uh, and have come to worship him. We saw his star. They were looking toward it. And then, uh, I, and, and, uh, I don't know what kind of star this was, but I think it's interesting. Once they got Jerusalem and they looked to the star, it says the star appeared and moved them right on over to Bethlehem. Pretty fascinating. So ultimately, the wise men look in the right place. Uh, not only did they look at the star, they also looked at the scriptures. Look at uh, verse 3 now, 3 through 6. It said, when Herod the king heard this, that they had come to worship, he was troubled. We talked about Herod last week, right? And all of Jerusalem with him, and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, so they bring the experts in the scriptures 
together, and he inquired about them where the Messiah, the Christ, was supposed to be born. And they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And he quotes them, O you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So even they looked to the star, but ultimately they looked to the scriptures, didn't they? And even though we're trying to, to look to the Lord in our life, ultimately we're going to find the best guidance is in the Word of God. That's where we need to be looking. What they didn't look for is ultimate answers in this world. I was thinking this week something very interesting. I was thinking about the faith not only of the wise men, whose faith led them away from the capital city and away from the palace to the actual place, a place in the middle of nowhere, a place where Jesus was born and put in a feed trough, a manger. Then I was also reminded of the thief on the cross. Thief on the cross, the one thief that looked at Jesus and declared him to be innocent, declared him as being a righteous man. And I thought, you know, if you were thinking about Jesus, the Messiah, the King of the Jews, the two places you wouldn't normally think to look is in a place in the middle of nowhere and in being born and laid in a feed trough. And you also wouldn't think about God being poured into the flesh, being executed by the Romans and murdered. You wouldn't expect that, right? Yet the faith of those two groups of people, the wise men and the thief on the cross, who saw Jesus had some most vulnerable worldly times, yet had the faith to recognize exactly who he was despite those worldly things. And so I'm here to tell you, you can't use worldly observations to bolster your faith. That's why we walk by faith, not by sight. Isn't that true? And so I ask you this morning, where are you looking? Where are you looking? What are you seeking? Where are you looking? And then finally, what do you give? Your level of joy at Christmas is also related to what you give. Matthew chapter 2 verse 11 says this, And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Of course, this is what the wise men are most famous for, right? Their gifts, the things that they gave. And some of the gifts seem to make perfect sense on the surface. Some of them are very odd on the surface. But the truth is, these gifts are all very appropriate. The wise men came to Jesus bearing gifts. Ultimately, the gifts they gave were entirely appropriate. Let's look at these three gifts. The first one was gold. Gold makes the perfect sense, right? If you're going to come to a king, if you got some gold, it's probably a good gift to give, right? I mean, what, I mean even in ancient days, I want you to think how, how amazing gold is, how long it's been valued and treasured. And even today, I mean, with the uses that gold has, the fact that some of the properties that gold has that, uh, unlike any other common metal we use, the fact that it it's, uh, doesn't tarnish, the, fa the fact that it's ductile, you can draw it uh, into thin wires, uh, the fact that it's so malleable, you can hammer it into to very, very thin sheets, yet it still retains a lot of its useful properties. It's an amazing thing. In some countries, you couldn't even approach the king unless you brought him some gold. <laughs> what an appropriate gift. It's a fitting gift. Gold is a very appropriate gift for a king. But also, it's a foretelling gift because uh, they're giving gold to a baby <laughs> who's born in a stable or at least with animals in a feed trough. It's a foretelling gift. It's a faithful gift knowing that this one day, this child is going to be ruling. It's also a foreordained gift. I thank God. I think the wise men were led to give this gift because no doubt this gold proved very helpful because there's a lot of things that had to happen. Not only did they had to go to Bethlehem for the census and be born and go back in Nazareth, but they also had at one time fled to Egypt. 
And so even though Joseph was a carpenter, there's not a lot of time to be uh, doing your carpentry when you're fleeing around the world trying to get away from various things. And so no doubt this gold helped to even had a very practical use. And so that shows that God is, is not just about giving mere symbols. He's also a practical God that gives good gifts to his children that are necessary when we need them. Wise men recognized the baby born in the manger was no ordinary baby. He was King Jesus. The wise men didn't cuddle him. They didn't play with him. Instead, they bowed the knee in reverence. And so I ask you, is Jesus your king? Is he your king? Is he worth gold? The second gift was incense, sometimes called frankincense. And this has to do with his sinless deity. You see, Jesus was not only king, he was God in human flesh. And the wise men fully understood, and I don't know if they actually, I don't know if they fully understood all of this or not, but I do know that the Holy Spirit led them to bring these gifts. And this Holy Spirit records these gifts. Incense was used as a priestly gift. Priests burn incense. In fact, the priests went into the temple into the holy place to burn incense. And they drew lots as to who was going to take their turn to burn incense. In fact, you might remember that Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, one of the things he did, he went into the temple because a lot fell to him to go burn incense. And while he was there, he was struck dumb for a time. He couldn't speak. And it's interesting that this gift was given him because the Bible tells us clearly that Jesus is our priest. A priest is one who deals with holy things. A priest is an intercessor that goes between man and God. And ultimately he's not just a priest, but he is the high priest. The book of Hebrews says he's not of the high priest of the order of Levi, but the order of Melchizedek, which means he's of a different priesthood. He has better sacrifices, the shedding of his own blood. And so I ask you this morning, that gift of incense representing at Jesus is our priest? Is Jesus your priest? Have you accepted him to come and make sacrifices on your behalf? That's what priests do. And then third is the most odd gift of all, and that is myrrh. Myrrh, his sacrificial death is represented in the myrrh. Because the third gift the wise men bring is this very valuable, yes, but kind of gum-like uh, resin substance that was used to embalm the dead. Can you imagine? We have a baby shower. <laughs> hey, here's some formaldehyde. <laughs> some formalin, you know. <laughs> Probably would be uh, thought of pretty strangely, don't you think? That's essentially what happened. These men brought a gift. And though it was a valuable gift, it was much more a meaningful gift. Knowing that Jesus ultimately is our sacrifice, his sacrificial death. I could go on and on the fact that Jesus came into the world for the express purpose to die for sinners like you and me. He came to be what the Bible calls a propitiation, which means someone who turns away wrath. In other words, we are objects of wrath because of our sin, the objects of wrath of God, but because of Christ's sacrifice and us accepting Christ's sacrifice, God's wrath is turned away. His death becomes our most valuable thing. His death becomes our life. It's also interesting um, when you read in, in John chapter 19, it says when um, Jesus was buried, that Nicodemus went and bought some myrrh to help embalm the body. Myrrh is also used uh, as a narcotic for to dull pain. And you might remember in the scriptures why Jesus was hanging on the cross. You can read about this in Mark 15. That when he came to the place, this is actually uh, Mark 15, verse 22. It says, when they bring him uh, to the place called Golgotha, which is being interpreted, interpreted the place of the skull, they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. In other words, they offered him a narcotic to deaden the pain of taking not only the physical pain, but no doubt it would, it would alter his mental state, taking upon the sins of the world. And Jesus refused it. He felt the full sting of the physical pain and ultimately the full weight of our sins upon him. 
his sacrificial death for us. And so I ask you this morning, is Jesus your sacrifice? Is he your king? Is he your priest? And is he your sacrifice? Have you guys ever heard of the story of the gift of the Magi written by Henry? I saw some students out there nodding their heads. That's the common thing that they're asked to read in school. At least my kids were anyway. It's about a story about Jim and Della. And you may be, if you don't remember the title, maybe you'll remember the story. A new young couple is married. They don't really have anything. Christmas time comes. They want to give a gift to their spouse. They don't have anything to give. Each of them, however, has one precious item that they have. Della has long, flowing, beautiful hair that is her prize. It's, in her mind, is the source of her beauty. It's one of the greatest things she has that she likes to think fondly of. Her husband, Jim, has a gold pocket watch. He treasures it so much because it was his grandfather's pocket watch. And they both begin to think, what can I give my spouse on this Christmas? And again, maybe you remember the story. So Della gets her hair cut off so she can buy a chain to give to Jim so he can put it on a pocket watch. And Jim, in trying to figure out what he can get, sells his pocket watch and buys some combs and brushes to give to his wife because he knows how she feels about her hair. And uh, it's so interesting. It's a short story. And on one level, it seems almost absurd, doesn't it? <laughs> it's almost like a folly at the end, you know? <laughs> you have a, wa a chain with no watch. <laughs> And you have brushes and, and, and combs with no hair. You think, what a tragedy of a story. Uh, but I wanted to, I actually should have waited. I want to read you the very last paragraph of that story of how Henry wrote it. Here's what he says. Because you might wonder, why is that called the gift of the Magi? Well, he tells you why. He says, the Magi, as you know, were wise men. Wonderfully wise men who brought gifts to the babe in the manger. They invented the art of giving Christmas presents. Being wise, their gifts were no doubt wise ones. And here I have lamely related to you the uneventful chronicle of two foolish children in a flat who, who most unwisely sacrificed for each other the greatest treasure of their house. But in a last word to the wise of these days, let it be said that all those who give gifts these two were the wisest of all who give and receive gifts. As such, they are the wisest everywhere uh, they are the wisest. They are magi. And what his whole point is was this. Because on one hand, let me ask you a question. What do you think Della thought was the greatest gift? Those combs that she received or the knowledge that her husband would give up the greatest possession he had for her? What do you think Jim thought about? Was he full of regret that now he had a chain with no wash to put on it? Or do you think the greatest gift that she had, he had, was the knowledge that his wife would give up something she held so dearly and prized so much for him? You see, the point is there is no greater gift than those things. Everything else is trivial. That's why I love that story. And I just want to lay at your feet this morning, because here's the, my closing thought for you. God gave us his best, and he expects we return to him our best. There's no greater gift that you can give or receive, and that's the joy of the Lord. Jesus died so you and I could have joy and peace and love. You know, sometimes we might ask God, maybe we're like the little boy who asked Jesus for a red wagon. You know, maybe some of us have prayed for things. And sometimes there's nothing wrong with praying for things that you need, physical things. But let me tell you, if God granted every 
requests you had given for material things and you have not received the, the peace, love, and joy of the Lord, truly you are poor indeed. Isn't that true? And if Jesus never granted one physical request you ever gave him, he never granted one physical thing, and you had peace, love, and joy in Christ, you still would be the richest man or woman alive, wouldn't you? And so I just want to tell you today, put your hope, look in the right direction, seek the right things, and give and receive the right gifts. And then Christmas for you will never be a disappointment. Every day of your life won't be a disappointment because nothing can surpass that. Nothing can surpass the joy of the Lord and the peace that we have with God and the love that we dwell in that Jesus died for and that we share with one another. I pray for that for you this very day. I pray you would come and receive the joy of the Lord. You know, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is my strength. It's what, get, it's what helps it get up every single day, the joy of the Lord. And I know some of you have been some very, through some very hard times. And maybe even this day you came in here and you thought, I just feel like throwing in the towel. I can't go another day. It's just too much for me to deal with. I pray today that you begin to re reevaluating your life. What are you looking at? What are you seeking? And what are you giving? And let me tell you, your life will never be the same. I pray if you've not confessed Jesus as Lord, like the wise men did, if you haven't come to worship him, to obey him as a Lord, let him wash away your sins in the waters of baptism so he could come and live in you by his spirit. That's the amazing thing. The wonderful counselor, Jesus is a wonderful counselor that can live in you. That's amazing. What a gift that is, the gift of the Holy Spirit. You're not going to be waiting any return lines after Christmas for that one, are you? <laughs> it's freely available to you if you just come and get it. And I pray you do. Let's all stand. <clears throat> Father, I thank you for what the wise men have taught us, God, and